Hi there, Fiddler Dan, and um, today I wanted to revisit, I guess, some physics of violin and talk about how a violin actually works. I think there's uh, a lot you can learn from understanding how it works, how a violin makes sound, and that can help improve uh, your, your playing, uh, what you're playing and why you're playing that way, and also instrument selection and all of the things uh, that go into making the violin that you like to play. So uh, I'm back in university mode. It's a, it's a kind of a lecture, but I hope informative. So, um, and I look forward to your feedback on it. So a violin works through uh, a signal chain of starting first with a vibrating string, then the strings themselves, what they're made up of, then we're vibrating the string uh, using a bow. Uh, we're changing the notes using our fingers. Uh, the technique that we use in the bow has an influence. The bridge of a violin, a big focus for luthiers, uh, is really important. And that drives the signal down then into the body of the violin through the bass bar and the sound post. And this produces a sound pattern. And so each of these elements has a big influence in how a violin works and how it produces sound. And you can modify all of these things through technique or through uh, changing the materials of a violin itself to change the sound, hopefully to arrive at a sound that you might like to get. So I'm gonna step through these uh, one at a time and we'll see how we go. And I'm back, that was a parcel of some tail pieces. Uh, the subject of my most recent video, if you want to check that out as well. That's a much deeper dive than what I'll be doing today, uh, looking particularly at the tailpiece and its contribution to uh, sound is produced. Right, so first, the vibrating string. Let's, uh, I got this off, um, off Wikipedia. Uh, essentially, a, a, a violin string is a vibrating string. We might vibrate, when we think of the note that's being produced, we're thinking of the fundamental of the note. So if you're playing the A string, this is what you're thinking that it's producing. But actually, you're getting much high, higher harmonics of that. Here we are, the A string, part of the A string is vibrating at twice the fundamental frequency, three times the fundamental frequency, and so on. And these are what we call the harmonics. And these higher order harmonics are what give the tone of, of a violin and um, how we manipulate those as a player is, uh, is critical to um, our, our sound and the sound that we get out of a violin. So that's a vibrating string in what we call standing mode. When we combine all of those vibrations together, we get a pattern like this. And this is the overall pattern of how a string is vibrating. Now a string vibrates uh, depending on how tight it is, its tension, and the mass of the string. So uh, if you're looking at the G string, it's a much heavier string. This slows down the frequency that it can vibrate at so that we get, um, we get that lower frequency than something like the E string, which is a comparatively small and thin string and usually at a much higher tension. And this gives it that higher note. So uh, string makers will vary the uh, composition of the string uh, the E string is often a steel string. Uh, and then we have the synthetic strings. And uh, if you're a purist, you might like to use gut strings. These uh, synthetic and gut materials have a different elasticity to steel. And this will change the response to uh, the different overtones that you're producing on your violin. So uh, a, a warmer string might have more of the overtones uh, and a, a purer string or a more direct string might just have some of those fundamental notes. Uh, additionally, we see in violin strings, there's uh, often a number of layers. In particular, you have the core of the string and then you have the layer around the outside. So whether you're choosing uh, aluminium or, or tungsten or some other material as a winding on the outside of the string, that affects the, um, the harmonic overtones or the color of the string if you like. So uh, string manufacturers will vary those to give you uh, a different kind of string with a different sound. The other thing to note is that these will change with, with age. 
So the synthetic, the synthetic materials, when stretched over time, and they continue to stretch, uh, you've actually got a different string at the end of a string's life than at the beginning. So uh, something well known like the Eva Parazzi strings uh, have that brilliant sparkle right at the beginning, but um, over time they tend to lose that. Uh, whereas a steel string is pretty much going to sound the, the same as the day you bought it, um, though you may not necessarily want to have uh, steel strings. So um, that's the strings themselves. How do we excite a string? Um, how do we put energy into that? Well, of course, mostly we use a bow for that. And so a bow uh, with the rosin on it, I made myself a little note there so that I don't forget. The rosin enables a bow to grip the string. But what it does is it grips it and then it slips the grip as the string vibrates and then it grips it again. And so uh, in this uh, video here, you can see uh, you've got a traveling wave going up and down as well as those pure harmonic tones that we might be looking for. So all of those things are uh, affecting the sound production. And I'll talk a bit in a moment about the effect of the bow itself and of course the bow technique on the, on the note that you're producing on the string itself. The most obvious thing is uh, when I looked at, at how a string vibrates, we think of it being a hard barrier at the bridge and a hard barrier at the nut. But of course, when, um, when your fingers are down, you're, you're creating this kind of soft node of where the string vibrates. As it gets shorter, you get higher in note. But the other thing that you're introducing with your finger is it's not a hard, hard barrier. It's this soft, squishy thing. So how soft and how squishy it is uh, will change and filter out the, uh, the tones and the overtones that you're producing. So when, you're, when your teacher's talking about your finger angle or the wrist which sets up that finger angle, these are all important things for, um, for tone produ production. Now the bow itself, we've got some bow hair exciting the strings, but we've also got a piece of wood uh, holding the um, horse hair together. And this wood itself is not immune to vibration, and so we get those same overtones vibrating up and down the bow and um, while you may not see that they're actually present there and this is why um, a bow and the quality of the bow can make such a difference to sound production because essentially the timber in a bow is supporting the vibrations that you're getting in the violin how well it supports that is um, well hey look it makes it makes half the sound of the violin and so uh, that's pretty important. So a stiff bow will affect uh, the harmonics that it supports uh, compared to a soft bow. Uh, so, um, and then you get something like a carbon fiber bow, which is fibers of carbon uh, encased in glue. And uh, guess what? The glues absorb uh, a lot of those uh, nuances of vibration. And so you get Typically with a carbon fiber bow, people say it's, um, it's, not, it's less expressive, uh, it's more direct. So um, all of those things are important when you're selecting a bow and has a direct, a direct influence on the sound, uh, principally because the, the bow is a vibrating component of the violin itself. Then we have, uh, we have bow technique and um, I've borrowed this um, this picture here, but um, essentially that's talking about Simon Fisher's uh, sound points. How close to the bow you go, how close to the bridge you go, how close to the fingerboard you go, are all going to affect the way that the string vibrates. So very, very close to the bridge there, you're going to favor a lot more of the high frequency uh, components. And as we get down closer to the fingerboard, you're influencing more the big vibrations in the bow or the lower frequency components. And we know that as violinists, um, we get a softer, warmer tone closer to the fingerboard than up near the bridge. Then you have uh, the influence of the speed that you're going to excite the bow and um, how fast that's moving across the string. And uh, believe it or not, your bow hold has a big influence as well on um, not just the angle of the bow, but how tightly you're gripping the bow is going to 
either influenced by absorbing or not absorbing the vibrations in the bow itself. So um, everything is tied up um, in, in itself uh, and quite complex just to make a nice sound. Uh, there's a little reference to Simon Fisher's uh, bow exercises. Um, you can see some of his stuff online and um, have a dive into his books if you are uh, of a technical bent. So the bridge, uh, the bridge is another critical component of sound production because what it's doing is it's actually transducting the sound from the vibrations of the strings and taking that down into the body of the violin so the body, can uh, the body of the violin can vibrate itself. And essentially what we have is um, it's another filter system. So each of your strings can vibrate and then they transmit those vibrations down through the wood down into the feet here. So how much timber there is in this path, and there's a cross path as well, influences how much of that sound comes down. So um, as a luthier, we might like to change how much timber there is by sculpting out timber here, sculpting out timber here, and of course the timber that you've got on the feet there. In a simplistic sense, that's all mass, and the more mass you have to move out of a string, uh, the more you're going to affect the, um, the vibrational characteristics of that. So uh, a string is vibrating sideways, and that sideways vibration is coming down through here to the body. And essentially, uh, it works by a bridge rocks from side to side, alternately shaking the plate. So if we look inside the violin, and I've pinched this uh, image off Wikipedia. Um, here's our violin bridge. Um, and you can think of this, uh, the sound post here, as the center point of a seesaw. And essentially, what I get, get one in, in, essentially, what you're doing is it's sitting in one place and, and vibrating like that for very large, slow moving frequencies because the sound post doesn't move much. But for the higher frequencies, and they're, they're going to be shorter wavelengths. Uh, you're going to get some of this component here going into the sound post. So you can see there that the orientation of the bridge on the bass bar is critically important, as well as the sound post here. And uh, the sound post, uh, people like to affectionately call it the sole of the violin, because you can easily move this position around. So if it's, um, if it's closer to the bridge, you're getting much more direct transduction if it's further away from the bridge, um, the vibrating of the bridge has, before the sound post can stop it, it has to travel a bit through the body, so you get a, a more of a translational component there. And then the location of the sound post itself, that is, how close is it to the treble foot or the, or the bass foot, because we can move the sound post both this way as well as up and down in the violin, and we can subtly affect the sound there uh, depending on the sound that you as a player are looking for uh, or getting the best out of uh, that instrument. So finally we've had the vibrations of uh, the strings and that's traveled now through the bridge and into the body. What's happening in the body is uh, something really really complex. It's a traditional shape. It's emerged over time and uh, with the bass bar sending the vibrations uh, up the full length of the plate on the bass side and the sound post on the other side. Um, the body is now free to uh, vibrate according to how the maker has, uh, has tuned that plate. Um, one such technique, uh, this is my son here, this is something called a Chaladni plate and this is a plate that we were vibrating at a known frequency. It's a steel plate and there are grains of salt on there and you can see here where the salt is settling, uh, we've got nodes. That is, that's not vibrating for that frequency that's being played. And here it's vibrating heavily and the salt has moved away from there. These patterns will change depending on the note that you're trying um, as the vibrations spread out over the main soundboard or the main skin of the drum, which is the top of the violin, um, being the more flexible spruce, uh, rather than the maple on the bottom, which tends not to move as much. And all of those together um, are going to be 
filtering out the sound that's come down from, uh, from the strings through the bridge and the body of the violin is essentially the filter uh, that's going to shape the sound depending on how the maker of the violin designed that. And that creates a sound but it doesn't end there because the sound comes out of the body depending on uh, whereabouts around the violin you'll hear it in some places more than others. This is um, a radio, what we call a sound radiation pattern coming out of a violinist and you can see here most of the sound is coming here out of the front of the body, not surprising as um, that's the front of the vibrating drum and you can actually see where the player is um, there's a lot less of the sound coming out where the player is. So um, <clears throat> the old adage that um, you only hearing a small part of the violin as a player and you really need someone else in in the room to help you evaluate the sound is uh, is absolutely true because of course what we're getting here is a more full-bodied sound coming out of the whole of the violin here where your ear is is um, is just a small fraction of that so um, I do hope hope that that has shed some light on I think I might have one more slide let me see Ah uh, yes, here we are. I, I do hope that um, going through how strings vibrate, what's made up of the strings themselves, um, the effect of bowing the strings, the effect of your fingers on the strings, bow technique, the bridge, the bass bar and sound post, the body and the sound pattern, all of those together produce the sound that you're going to want. So uh, whether you're playing an uh, electric violin, which is quite different, uh, whether you're playing uh, a regular violin, but notice here the unusual bow hold producing the sound that um, the Secret Garden duo are looking for, uh, or whether you're a young hack like myself just a few short years ago, um, I do hope that this has illuminated a little bit about how a violin works, and um, I'm hopeful it might sit somewhere in the back of your head, and you might think uh, next time you need to change strings, bridge, um, or your bow or the sound post um, just understand the complexity that's behind that and when you're listening to your teacher and they're giving you specific exercises to do you can say hey I understand that's going to affect how I sound how I'm going to sound and this is why so um, yeah well, that was a lot to download in uh, not very long so um, I hope it's of some use and look forward to hearing from you thanks very much bye for now